Okay, guys, so today we're going to talk about um, uniform plane waves. So, whoops. And um, sort of this is the starting point, you know, we talked about, so the, the sort of the sequence of our discussions, we started with transmission lines uh, from an electrical standpoint. Then we moved to electromagnetics. So now we're in Maxwell's equations. And during the last few lectures, we covered electrostatics magnetostatics, inductance. So electrostatics goes with, um, with um, you know, calculating the capacitance of the line per unit length. Magnetostatics goes along with calculating the inductance of the transmission line per unit length. And so those are the things we've covered so far, I think. So now we're going to talk about um, when you have an electromagnetic wave that is not really constrained by a channel, let's say, and that would be a plane wave. Good morning, Sebastian. Thanks. Um, so this is the plane wave. So what does a plane wave mean? Um, a plane wave to me means a wave that doesn't change. Basically, if I draw plane waves moving in a certain direction, let's say the direction is this way, the waves are, nothing's changing about the wave as it's moving in a particular direction. If you plotted any slice of that plane wave, it would look like a flat response. So this is, I don't, you know, it's not really that you can launch plane waves into space. So this is basically where we're going with the plane waves is towards antennas, which is sort of um, um, something that I think it'll be, you guys are all familiar with and we'd like to sort of get to covering. But a plane wave is like, to me, is like a model of what would happen so what, like typically, like it's easy to think of having a source of some kind of a source of electromagnetic radiation and then the electromagnetic radiation radiating radially out of it in our direction. So, you know, like you can think of like a cell phone antenna working like that. It's not really directional. It's, you know, you have your antenna either receiving or transmitting your cell phone antenna base station kind of thing. And, but it's really radiating in all directions because it might be getting data from all directions or sending data to all directions. So the way I look at a plane wave is mostly if, if you have a situation like that and you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom way in to these sort of spherical waves in each in each little slice of the spherical wave, you can you can kind of think about these waves being straight lines, plane waves. If you plot, that's how I look at it. As you, if you plot along any of these places, you can kind of see them as a plane wave. So that's kind of what we mean by a plane wave. And there's lots of different ways of. Let me let me actually sort of first draw right mathematically what it would look like. So let's say if you have the simplest version of a plane wave, so let's say the electric field field is only in the x direction, is only in x direction. Uh, I should say only has only has an x component. So if I, I could write that mathematically, so it would just be E sub X Z T. So this would be a traveling wave. And notice that it basically, 
because the electromagnetic wave, the electric part of the wave, can only exist in a direction perpendicular to the direction of motion, the direction of travel is... So it's only, hmm. so travel in only in direction of Z. And it changes with time. And it um, only has a Z X component. And so I'm going to assume that that is only going to be like a sinusoidal or cosine type wave. So I'm going to draw that as E sub zero or write that the equation for that cosine of omega t minus beta z. And basically this means that it's a sinusoidal wave. Um, and this is that it changes in time with frequency omega. Okay. So this looks a lot like our, if you, again, going back to remembering our, um, our the waves the voltage waves or current waves traveling in a transmission line, they had the same type of equation, okay? There was a voltage as a function of Z and T. The voltage had some amplitude, so there was some V0 or V plus, and it was a lot of times we assumed it was in either a cosine or sine format, and it had some um, um, sort of uh, frequency or group frequency, etc. I'll talk about that in a second. And it had some function of time like omega t. So this looks a lot like the, I mean, it is the same equation for the voltage traveling wave, but here it's the electric field traveling wave. And the way, you, again, you can think of a transverse, a transverse, electromagnetic wave the way these things travel is uh, you know I'm gonna try to draw it probably really badly so that you're gonna have an electric component there's like a direction of travel is in the Z direction you can think of the electric component in this case being in the x direction and the magnetic component has to be perpendicular to both the direction of the electric field and the direction of travel so it'll be in the y direction so it's kind of the visual i have for so that's the um, you know the h field which we'll look at in a little bit so that's a really poor drawing but if you guys can, I don't know if you can see me on the screen, but let's say my, um, my pen here is the direction of travel for this wave. So the electric field will be like only in one plane perpendicular to that. And the magnetic field will be perpendicular to both. And so the electric field is changing perpendicular to the direction of the electric field, but there is no other electric field component 
in other directions, either in the direction of the travel itself, so or so you don't want any electric field, this would be not be a transverse electromagnetic field because the electric field wouldn't be transverse to the direction of travel. So it'd be some other mode of running. So in a transverse electric field, the electric field is perpendicular to the direction of Z travel and so is the magnetic field. Yeah, so Alexandria asked, is the EX in, in the Y plane and H field in the X plane? So it's actually the opposite of that. So E sub X, well, let's see, let me think. No, E sub, by this, I mean the E sub X would be in the X, X plane. Hmm. So E, so if you're asking planes, so that's a, that's a good question. I mean, let me, let me draw it in Cartesian coordinates to make sure I'm giving you the right answer there. So let's say this is the um, Z direction. This is X and this is Y. So let's say my wave is traveling along the Z direction. So the wave would be traveling in that direction. And the electric field would only have a X component. Okay, that would make the, the electric field, that would put the electric field in the X Z plane. So it would be basically this a plane made up by these, because I remember a plane, if you're talking about a plane, it's made up by two axes. So it would be in basically this plane, the XZ plane. So the component, so the, the axis Z, and then E sub X would only have an X component. So it would only exist in this, XZ plane moving and then it's moving the wave is moving in the direction of the Z plane but the electric field would have only have an X component and then the magnetic field would be in the Y direction in in our case in the case of our example and so it would only e exist so H field would only be in YZ plane in this case. So, but, so Alexandria, but we could have easily switched it out the other way. We could have said that the electric field is in the um, YZ plane and the magnetic field is in the XZ plane, or we could have, like, again, I'm sorry with the, uh, with the visuals here, but like, as long as the X, the E, e field and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other and the direction of travel, they could be either traveling like this, they could be traveling like that, they could be traveling like that, they could be traveling like that. So there's, you can think of it, they could be lying in any of those components as long as they're perpendicular to each other and the direction of the travel, then it like sort of satisfies this transverse electromagnetic idea. And so in this case, just mathematically, we've decided to make the electric field only have an X component, okay? Just to make the math along sort of a, a coordinate um, direction. We'll see it a little bit later that we can make the direction of travel an arbitrary direction of travel. But for now, we're saying the direction of travel is in the Z direction and E is only in the X direction. Okay, so having said that, now the last bit is this beta, again, reminiscent of the, um, uh, the, uh, the sort of the phase velocity or something that de determined the velocity in the um, transmission lines. And so beta 
is defined also in this case as omega over mu sub p, okay? Mu sub p in this case is defined, well, it's always defined as omega over beta. So beta is equal to omega over mu sub p, and then mu sub p in this case is defined as omega square root of mu epsilon. Okay, so this is for so this is for a lossless media so far. And if you guys remember, mu is the permeability of the media. And epsilon is the permittivity of the media, whatever is traveling through. And in free space, free space, mu would be mu naught, which is the permeability of free space. And epsilon would be epsilon naught, which is the permittivity of free space. And in all other media, they would have some multiplier by that. Everything would be like a bigger number. So I don't know if you had glass that this was traveling through or some other media, they would have something that would multiply, that would be a property of that material and it would increase the permittivity or the permeability by a certain amount. Okay, and so this now, so these are all like very, everything is analogous to the equations for the transmission line. So this equation looks like the same equation, which is a traveling wave equation for voltage. Now we have a traveling wave equation for the electric field with similar, like the math looks exactly similar. Here, the math looks, if you guys look back on the transmission line, and if I now basically write the phase velocity is equal to one over square root of mu epsilon. If you guys remember the phase velocity for a, so going uh, the risk of, so, um, so remember, remem remember for transmission line, the phase velocity was one over square root of LC. So everything is very reminiscent of the same equation. So in the case of a transmission line, the phase velocity is one over square root of LC. In the case of a transverse electromagnetic wave, sort of this permeability is related to inductance and permittivity is related to capacitance, sort of in the electric and magnetic fields versus you know, sort of voltage and current or inductance and capacitance. So now we end up with this equation for the phase velocity. And in the case of a vacuum or free space, This is equal to one over square root of mu naught epsilon naught. And this number is approximately three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Okay. Now, just as a historic aside, this number three times 10 to the, so that means a, if you launch a electromagnetic wave in, in a vacuum, in free space, if you launch it, it will travel with a constant speed of three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It'll just travel to wherever it's going at that speed. And that is the same speed, same as speed of light. Speed of light in a vacuum. And that's how in vacuum, and that's how Maxwell 
uh, established, discovered, I don't know if you knew ahead of time or you proved it, is that light is an electromagnetic wave. So any electromagnetic wave that you launch is going to be traveling at that speed through space. So for example, let's say data is, you know, you're, you're, you're using your cell phone. You are your, so what, when you're using your cell phone, obviously there's electromagnetic waves going back and forth between your phone and the tower, right? They're just send, receive, send, receive. So I don't, I don't really remember the frequency of what cell phones run at. It's around two and a half gigahertz, say, something like that. So that two and a half gigahertz talks to this omega component, okay? That sh says how fast is the, the carrier I don't want to go too far into um, um, wireless transmission, but there's a carrier basically means the electric field is just changing at that rate, two and a half gigahertz. But regardless of what the, if you're using, I guess people don't even use GSM anymore. If you're using LTE or 5G, which is probably at like a different frequency and all that stuff, that just means how fast the, electromagnetic wave is changing with time but in all cases the speed of that electromagnetic wave leaving your phone and going basically you're rating it in all directions part of it goes to the tower but anyway the speed of that electromagnetic wave getting to the tower in all cases is the speed at which electromagnetic waves travel through the air which you know, air is the, the permeability, permittivity of air. They're kind of close to free space. It'll, it'll be a little slower than free space, but it's like close enough, but it's be whatever the speed of light is, speed of electromagnetic waves are in air. That's how fast that electromagnetic wave will leave your cell phone and travel towards a tower or travel radially out. So, um, okay. So that, so that's just comes from, so, and that just comes from, so this equation again, which is hopefully is supposed to link this idea of this wave with the waves we talked about in the transmission line describes that, that travel. Okay, so now that's the electric field. Once we say that's the electric field, now the question is what about the magnetic field? So what about the H field? So, oops. So what about H field? Uh, can you scroll up a little bit to see the graph, please? Sure. This one? Think. Yes, thanks. Sure. It's good, thanks. Okay, thanks. So what about the H field? Well, it once you have the electric field, you can get the H field from Maxwell's equations. So although it does get mathematically a little bit complicated, but basically we have an equation from Maxwell's equation that says the curl of the E field is minus mu times the rate of change of the magnetic field. Okay, so basically we have this electric field. I just defined it in the form of this wave equation. So, and that's equal to the mu times the rate of change of the magnetic field. So if I can take this, this is the curl operation. So if I cur take the curl of the E field, then I can integrate it with respect to time and get the H field, okay? Now to do that, okay, we, I had to look this up myself. So, okay, I don't, I don't, I don't think any of you guys will remember it. So the curl operator, so this, 
this is like a Wikipedia thing. So the curl of a vector is the, well, let me just draw it for you guys. It's like, what you do is, it's the determinant of a matrix, okay? So hold on a second. So this is a matrix that you make in the following way. So in Cartesian coordinates, coordinates, the matrix coordinates. So this is the definition of curl of E, okay? In Cartesian coordinates. So first you put in the unit vectors for the coordinates. Remember X hat, Y hat, and Z hat are unit vectors that are X hat, Y hat, and Z hat are unit vectors in direction of x, y, z axes. Okay, so this is the matrix. And then the next thing you put in is d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. Okay, then you put in the components of your electric field. In this case, we only have an x component for the electric field and zeros for the Y component, okay? And finally, what you do is you figure out, you calculate the determinant of this guy, of this matrix. Okay, what does the determinant mean? Well, the determinant means that what you do is you have X, first you have X hat, this guy multiplied by this guy minus this guy operating on this guy. Then so, let me put it this way, is gonna be x hat. This is the determinant operation, okay? D by dy zero. So that's this. Minus d by dz zero. Y, Z of zero. Okay, in this case, they're both zero, so this whole thing goes to zero. Plus Y hat, so plus Y hat, and then D by DX zero minus D by DZ EX. No, I'm sorry, D by DZ EX minus D by DX. Sorry, what am I doing? Yeah, so D by d by dz e x minus d by d x zero. So I, I wrote these things backwards. It shouldn't matter, but let me correct it. So that d by dx, d by dz, so x would be d by dz zero minus, it's the same result it will be zero. So this is zero plus this plus z hat um, d by dy dx minus d by dx zero. Okay, that's the definition of determinant. And so fortunately, because we defined E of X as being, so E as only being in the, having an X component. So this guy goes to zero. There was no components of X in the Z or Y directions. Okay, this guy also goes to zero, D by DY EX, because your EX again is, doesn't have any Y component. So this one also goes to zero. This is zero, and this is zero. So you just end up with y hat d e sub x over d z. Okay, as so this is curl of e. And so 
basically we can set this curl of E equal to this guy. That was the whole point of doing that. So it is minus, oh, sorry, I screwed up, guys. Set up the, I, I had it right the first time. So this is minus plus, um, minus plus, minus plus, sorry. So it was this minus this guy is equal to minus um, mu dh dt. So these two cancel each other out. And basically, this is what we end up with. And basically, now we can integrate both sides of that equation. So what we do is we're going to take the... Um, integral of y dex dz with respect to time is equal to integral of mu dh dt with respect to time. Okay, so we basically integrate both sides And we plug in the equation for E sub X from up here into our integral. Okay, so I won't do the integral. I'll just give you right down the result. This is basically you end up with, I'm gonna sort of switch the direction. So here it's mu um, H. y is equal to plus beta e naught over omega cos of omega t minus beta z or hy is plus beta Epsilon naught over omega mu cos of omega t minus beta z. So this is the equation for a traveling magnetic field. All right, so going back to our traveling electric field is we said if the the electric field has this value e sub zero. It only has, it's only in the direction of, it only has an x component and it's traveling in the z and t direction with, it, it changes with respect to time with this value omega and it travels in the z direction with this kind of constant beta. So if this is the case, then the magnetic field ends up being this so if we define the electric field like that the magnetic field is comes out to look like this so it changes this cosine of omega t means that it's changing in time with the same rate as the electric field the beta z says it's moving along the z direction at the same with the same constant beta as the electric field so basically the magnetic field is traveling and changing at the sort of same time and spatial rates as the electric field it only has a y direction let me write some of this stuff down so magnetic field only has y component and the amplitude with respect to the electric field is this value so amplitude as function of E field is this value so it has the value of the electric field it has this beta component, which is this thing that describes 
sort of how fast it's moving and it's got the omega which is the frequency respective time over the permeability so it's got these components in it okay um, 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 um what i want to say about that so again i i think i i did a little bit of a thing here so a little bit of a shortcut here so the electric field we only ended up so this rate of change of ex when we did the determinant only had a y component which said then i start, started only looking at the y component of the magnetic field that's why i went from this to h sub y only because it says whatever i would end up with at the end of this integral would only have a y component okay now if i so the electric field has as only has components in the x direction the magnetic field only has components in the y direction and they're both traveling in the same direction with the same rate of change which is kind of what we're this came straight out of Maxwell's equations because they can they said that the changing electric field would lead to a changing magnetic field and a changing magnetic field would lead to a changing um, electric field let's see so Patrick is asking why does d by dy ex is equal to zero but d by dz ex does not Ah, good question. D by DZ EX. Yes. Good question. Let's see, what did I get wrong here? Let me think about that. That's a really good question, Patrick. Let me let me think about that real quick. So let me let me um, park that question, which is a very good one. Uh, D by D Z E X. Let's see. Do I have a quick answer to that? So d by dy, d by dz ex has a value, d by dy ex does not. Yeah. So, okay, I think I have the answer for you, Patrick. It comes from the math here. So notice that the way, whoops, going jumping too far ahead when we defined e sub x okay it has a z component but there's no y component here right so if i take the derivative of this with respect to y i'm going to get zero just look at the equation right e zero cosine of omega t minus beta z but if i take the derivative with respect to z I have Z here in the equation for electric field. So I get something that's non-zero. Does that make sense, Patrick? Okay, good. Okay. So, all right. Okay, so, so here we are, so we have this electric field and magnetic field, again, they're both perpendicular. So the elect in, our, in the way we defined it, we defined electric field in the X direction only. It created a magnetic field in the Y direction only, and they're traveling in the Z direction together. Okay, so now let, if you look at the, the basically the 
ratio of the amplitudes between the electric field and the magnetic field. So if we just look at this component here, which is, so the electric field, remember, was just E sub zero, and the magnetic field is um, this whole value, which is a function of E sub zero. So if I say H sub Y, so if I say, um, if I just call this whole thing, if I call this whole thing h sub zero, then I could say that h sub zero is beta over omega mu e sub zero. And so the ratio of e sub zero over h sub zero is beta over omega mu. Beta is defined as, went up to here. So beta itself is this guy, omega square root of mu epsilon. So I'm gonna plug that in. I wrote this wrong, sorry guys. This should be, I flipped it. So E sub zero, H sub zero should be omega mu over beta. So this is omega mu over omega square root of mu epsilon. So this gives square root of mu over epsilon. And notice that so this is the ratio of the electric field to the magnetic field amplitudes. And this, just like this looked a lot like this sort of velocity, this group velocity looked a lot like a group velocity in a transmission line with mu and epsilon sort of taking the place of inductance and capacitance. So just like that, this looks a lot like the characteristic impedance of a transmission line. So if you guys remember C sub zero, so characteristic impedance of a transmission line was square root of L over C. So this looks a lot like that. So it looks a lot like characteristic impedance of T lines. So with ratio of L over C, giving the ratio between the voltage and the current, in this case, mu over epsilon gives the relationship between the electric and the magnetic fields, okay? So in my mind, I, this is sort of at a really high level. Um, this brings us back together. So how should I put this that it won't be too confusing? So at a very high level, you have electric fields and you have magnetic fields and you have a certain direction of travel for these waves. Okay. So things like voltage and then, sorry. So at the high level, you have electric field, magnetic field, and then you have permeability and permittivity that describe the relationship between the electric and magnetic field and the whatever, the material is that they're traveling through. Okay, so that's what electromagnetic describes. Maxwell's equations describe this traveling wave. So to make life easy for circuit designers, okay, we've created these concepts of inductance, capacitance, voltages, and currents. So we've just created those concepts so that 
we don't have to worry about electromagnetic fields. So they have this analogy together. So to go from electric field and magnetic field to voltages and currents, we basically are, you know, created this transformation, I want to, want to think about it, between perme permittivity and permeability and, and inductance and capacitance. So inductance and capacitance, I don't know, going back to where we, where, how I described them coming from the magnetostatic analysis and electrostatic analysis, it looked like, you know, we're just kind of, they have very loose definitions of inductance and capacitance. And the reason for that is we're just using them to go from electric and magnetic field to voltages and currents. Okay. So this is probably like a very, so in other words, the transmission lines, we could have easily looked at those or learned those together from the standpoint of electromagnetics as an electromagnetic wave traveling as opposed to voltages and currents, inductance and capacitance. We could have easily done it the same way. They're exactly the same thing. In fact, the electromagnetic description is probably is more, you know, correct, I guess, because our the way we describe transmission lines was just a two wire transmission line. So why did we bother to do that? Why did we create the concept of voltage and current as opposed to just stick with electric field and magnetic field? Um, so why, why go through this extra step? Well, the real reason I believe is that electric field and magnetic field, these are vector fields. So you can see how much more difficult the math is, as difficult the math was for transmission lines, but here, these are vectors. So I have to do things like when I'm doing calculations, I have to do things like curls. I have to do determinants of matrix and these kind of things because there are vectors. Voltages and currents are, aren't vectors. They're just scalar components. So we can just deal with them a lot easier than we can with vector fields like electric field and magnetic field. So for engineering reasons is why we created the concept of electric potential, which is voltage or current, which is sort of this movement of charge with some velocity. Um, but sort of the real, as best as we can understand it, the real thing going on is electric field, magnetic fields, and those kind of direction of travel. So anyway, that's, that's like at a high level, and this is showing how they are analogous. So, okay, so the other, th the, the, the reason this electrical, the electromagnetic treatment is more complete than the transmission, the voltage and current treatment is if you notice in this case, I talked about um, electromagnetic field. I was using the example of electromagnetic fields traveling through air, so through a non-conductive media. So electromagnetic fields, you can describe them as traveling through any kind of media. So they can go, or any shape for that matter. So it could be a fiber optic cable, it could be a waveguide, it could be a two-wire transmission line that could be like a coax cable, it could be um, like sort of going over a wireless transmission. So it's really a complete picture of how electromagnetic waves travel. The way we got from that to a, something that's easier to engineer with in a transmission line is we limited the analysis only to two wire transmission lines. So that was how we went from this vector fields and electric and magnetic fields that can describe travel through any shape and media. We said, okay, let's just simplify that to 
two wires and that way we go from that complex calculation to these concepts that are easier to handle like characteristic impedance um, and resistance and and vo uh, sorry uh, voltages and currents okay so anyway, that might be that might confuse that that might confuse you more than it um, describes that helps you understand but that's the linkage between uh, electromagnetic treatment of exactly the same phenomenon and then the transmission line treatment of the same phenomenon so one is just easier to deal with for electrical engineers than um, than the other all right um, so just as um, just as a way to go back to I think um, one of our earlier questions, let's say if we said, so going back to this equations, we could have easily said that the electric field is only has a Y component. So sorry, let me, and so if we had said that there's only a Y component for the electric field, and that was E sub Y zero omega T minus beta Z, then the magnetic field would have only been in the x direction so as long as they're perpendicular to each other it's that they just have to be perpendicular to each other so i could have easily said the electric field could be in the y direction and traveling in the z direction changing with time and then h of x will be the only component And the ratio of E sub Y to H of X would have been square root of mu over epsilon. So as long as they're perpendicular to each other, that's basically, they just end up being perpendicular to each other. That's a transverse electromagnetic wave. Okay. Okay, so now we just so just as just as we could change the the relative direction of the x you know the x, the electric and magnetic field you know they could be either like this or they could be like that if you always think of my right hand being magnetic field and left hand being electric field they could be traveling not just in the z direction they could be traveling in any direction that could be traveling in any direction. So if I draw that, so, so, um, so the ENM wave wave can be traveling in any direction, not just Z. So as long as, as E is perpendicular to H, and they're both perpendicular to direction of travel we have a transverse electromagnetic wave so if i was going to draw this let me draw the z in this direction x here and y so again cartesian coordinates so i could say the electromagnetic wave is traveling in the z x plane in some so direction of propagation, propagation. So it could just be traveling in the ZX plane. I'm just making something up, right? With, with an angle of theta between the direction of travel and Z and with an angle of 90 minus theta respect to the X axis. 
And so in this case, the electric field could be pointing in this direction, perpendicular to it. And the magnetic field could be, let me try and get a color that's different than these guys. could be in this direction as long as it's perpendicular to each other and they're both perpendicular to the direction of propagation or vice versa. The electric field could be, so this is the H field. So it could have switched the direction or we could have rotated these around as long as you could pick any direction of travel you want and as long as the electric and magnetic waves are perpendicular to each other in the direction of travel, it's, you're okay. Okay, so, we're going back to all these analogies with the transmission line. So the other analogy we're gonna make is the phaser notation. And so just as, as a reminder of phasor notations, so what we did was we said when voltage is a function of Z and T with this type of equation, V sub zero cosine of omega T minus beta Z, um, we can write this in complex notation. And that's equal to V sub zero e to the j omega t. Whoops, I have to put them all in it. Sorry. So V sub zero e j omega t minus beta z. So that's equal to each other. It's complex notation. And then to go to, so that's going from here to here, and then to go from here, the complex notation to phasor notation, I'm gonna drop um, the e to the j omega t to go to phasor notation. And the whole idea behind this phasor notation was to, because e to the j omega t we're not really messing around with that much. It's just sort of um, a fact of the electromagnetic wave. But when we're looking at vectors, when we're taking derivatives, all these things, we're not really messing with the omega t, e to the j omega t part. So we can drop it at the beginning of the calculations and add it back at the end of the calculations. That was the whole idea for the phasor notation. So we can drop that and end up with v sub zero e to the minus j beta z, sort of in phasor notation. So that ended up being, whoops, the phasor notation of the same thing. So, so this would be the phasor equivalent. Was this v hat this is z, which is only a function of z, v zero to the minus j beta z. So we just dropped the minus um, ZB component. Okay, so, okay, so this is what happens when you're traveling in the Z direction only, okay? But if um, in the, so if you look at the, Cartesian coordinates again. Let's say this is Z, this is um, Y, and this is X. And let's say I have a direction, a vector in this direction. This direction is gonna be X 
x hat plus y, y hat plus z, z hat. Okay, that's going to be that vector with this being the y component, this being the z component, and it's going to be very hard for me to draw the x component, but you guys get the idea. So that's the direction of this <clears throat> vector. Or to make it a little bit easier, we can just call this whole thing R, the R direction, the R vector. Okay, so if I use that with this, it's just so it gives me sort of a general direction of travel ends up being V zero E to the minus J beta dot R. <clears throat> Is the phasor notation for travel in an arbitrary direction along a vector r <clears throat> which is just defined it's just sort of a um, shorthand way of way of um, sort of defining direction in cartesian coordinates okay so So if we have that case of, I'm not going to go too far with this arbitrary travel, direction travel, but just trying to give you guys a sort of a flavor of, I'm, I'm trying to get you guys the concept that basically this electromagnetic wave can travel in any direction, whatever direction it wants. So again, if I, if we had this guy, so we just looked along the z x axis and we had this travel in you know beta was basically beta x x hat plus beta z z hat let's just say it was traveling in that x z plane um, with an angle theta between the direction of propagation and the z-axis, then um, e to the minus j beta dot r would looks like would be the same as e to the minus j beta x x plus beta y y, and beta sub x would be beta sine of theta beta sub y would be beta cosine of theta and basically we could basically like look at the electromagnetic wave with these type of way of looking at it so you'd have different beta components in sort of in along the different coordinates and basically you'd make your math more difficult because you have to keep travel keep track of all these components along the different basically you're mapping those up into the x y z axes but it's basically the same as what we did here which we just sort of to make the math easier we just made the electric and magnetic field in a direction, we just made the, the, the travel in the direction of z-axis only and made the, whoops, sorry guys, this thing went nuts. So, but, but basically you can deal with any direction of travel. And again, when you think about your cell phone, that is getting transmitted the information from the cell phone is getting transmitted in all in all directions so you can basically think of it in all um, it just makes the, again makes the math a little bit more difficult all right Okay, guys, so let's take a break here um, for about, um, I guess, 15 minutes. Goodbye, a break.
and be back at like 9.20.
Okay, guys. Hopefully you can still see my uh, my um, good notes shared. So, Amina, you wrote a note saying you wanted to solve um, lectures or problems in lectures so we can be ready for the quizzes and final. So have you tried doing the, um, or a study guide related to the final? Okay, so um, have you guys, so in prepping for your quizzes and stuff, have you guys done, tried doing the, um, whatever practice problems are put up? So you guys, yeah, but it would make sense when you see you solve it. So is the problem that you guys look at those practice problems and don't, I see. Okay, gotcha. So would you guys be happy if you just saw me solve those practice problems? There aren't enough practice problems. Like, so that's, that's what you guys are looking for. Amina seems to say yes. <laughs> Sounds good. I mean, okay. So what I will do then is, is I'll make a video. We want to make sure we are studying the right topics for the final. Or even if you post a video. So, okay. So again, let me, let me just to make sure. So, I was what I was trying to do with the quizzes and assignments was to you know have without giving you the same exact problem was to give you guys the assignments as something related to the quizzes so that anyway you guys would have that relationship so to me that was my attempt at having you guys study the right things for the quizzes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now post videos. I'm going to just make a few videos where I am solving the, the assignments that we had, okay, including the assignment I have for the quiz coming up next Friday so you guys can see my my thinking and then i'm hoping the quizzes are going to be related to the assignments but not a direct you know one-to-one -one correspondence does, does that make sense okay cool okay so that's that's easy enough and then you know i was a little more time to quiz too okay how much time would you guys like I'm happy to give you as much time as you like. <laughs> um, would you like an hour for the quiz? Is that good? <laughs> get started today, yeah. But um, wh how much time would you like? One hour? An hour and a half? Whatever. It's fine with me. So I'll give you guys an hour for the... Or actually, one, I'll give you guys an hour 30. Okay. So uh, deal. So an hour 30 for the quiz, and I'll put up videos um, explaining the solution, okay? So the first one that I'm gonna drop will be this latest assignment that I put up. So I'll make a video for that this weekend so that you guys can basically walk, you know, walk with me through the explanations and for the quiz coming and then I'll go back and do the all the other assignments and the final is just going to be you know I'm not going to get too ambitious for the final it'll be just a version of the kind of things we did for the quizzes and those assignments so hopefully that'll that'll work with you guys for you guys all right okay um, you know, for the final, I think I'm not going to have it multiple choice. So for the final, I'm going to make it um, like you'll solve the actual issues and stuff, solve the problems. 
and the final will be take home. It'll be, you know, so at like a, a 24 hour, would you guys like 24 hours or like 48 hours? It doesn't matter to me. We'll make the final 48 hours. How's that? And so you can just, um, you can just, um, I'll, it'll be up on, what's the, I'm trying to think, is the last, is the final day 19th for us? I think it's the 19th, whenever it is. So it'll just be up at 8 a.m. And then like you'll have till Sunday, 8 a.m. Um, to, to basically turn it in. So a couple of days for the final. Cool. Okay, guys. All right. So now, now comes the sad news. And hopefully I've cheered you guys up. The sad news is the next topic is antennas. Which are like, what do you call it? Put on your seatbelts for this one. Okay, so um, so antennas. Okay, so what does that mean? You guys have all heard about antennas, probably since you were little kids, right? I, I remember having, you know, messing with TV antennas and stuff. Thankfully, you don't have those, but now we have them for cell phones. Um, you know, your Wi-Fi antenna is not good enough or whatever. So what does that all mean? Okay, so let's say you guys are, um, I don't know, you're building a wireless system, you're building a, let's say you're building a, something um, that needs to be wireless, right? You're building something, just for the sake of example, right? Trying to make this something that you guys might be could could think about. Let's say you've got a um, let's say you've got a you're building a temperature sensor. So you're doing a temperature monitor monitor. Okay, and then that's that's doing something it's a you know integr in internet of things product so you're putting it in a, a, a different room in your house let's say and you want it to give the temperature results to your wi-fi network in your house stuff that like we all buy right or like let's say you have a baby monitor so there's a camera and then it basically like sends that video wirelessly to your Wi-Fi or you know you're sitting with your computer working somewhere in your home and that's part of the Wi-Fi network so let's say you're actually in charge of designing this thing so the temperature sensor is easy to think about because it's you know it's not running at some some crazy speed we all understand temperature so you imagine you have like an electronic thermometer Okay, I'm just doing this really simple block diagram of what you would design. And let's say you stick the result of that into a microcontroller. And you're programming, I don't know, you're writing some C code to program this microcontroller. And then that gives you some result of something, let's say just the actual temperature. Okay, so this is still in like bits and bytes and things, right? Imagine, I'm assuming you guys all have some sort of, a, maybe you haven't done microcontroller programming, but you kind of know, okay, I do C code, I, I get it to read the temperature, etc. So I've got some voltages, values coming out of here. Okay, so, so far so good. Then you go, okay, so now my... Wi-Fi base station is sitting somewhere here. Wi-Fi base station sitting somewhere uh, 10, 10, 20 meters away, okay? And no, you know you're gonna have to launch some electromagnetic wave, right? You, there's no connect, physical connection to that Wi-Fi base. And so you know, okay, I need to launch an electromagnetic wave. Maybe it'll look like a spherical wave. Maybe it looks like a plane wave, like we talked about. 
Okay, but basically you need to launch an electromagnetic wave. And you have these voltages and currents here, just like we're all, you guys are all familiar with from the lab or working or whatever. You have that, you have this electromagnetic wave, how do you create one from the other? Okay, so that thing is an antenna. I don't know if there's an, I'll just draw it as that. Is something that basically goes for electrical engineers anyway, is we're doing our designs with, you know, voltages, currents, et cetera, on printed circuit boards. And now we wanna transmit that wirelessly to someplace else, or we wanna receive um, some signal back from some wireless thing. I use the example of, uh, so again, a Wi-Fi based system, but let's say if you were a cell phone designer, you would have the same problem. You would be making your cell phone, it's all in binary values and microprocessor, microcontroller, you're talking about voltages and currents, and all of a sudden you're talking about a plane wave or electromagnetic wave you're transmitting. So basically the connection the bridge between those two is this thing called the antenna, okay? And so what antennas do essentially is they create E and M waves or, or they receive E and M wave, waves, receiver antenna, okay, depending on how you look at it. So the question, the first question we have to ask before we get into antennas is, so what mechanism is responsible for creating the waves? Creates. So to do that, we're going to take a little bit of a detour and talk about something called, so we need to, so we, for, let's just say for analytic reasons, for an, analy analytic reasons, meaning that Believe it or not, what I'm about to tell you is going to make the math easier, but it's not going to seem like it because it's pretty complex, but the alternative would be even worse. Um, we are going to look at a new quantity called a magnetic vector potential. Okay, so this is a concept. Hopefully you'll see it at the end of my lecture here that like it'll make some level of sense, but just except for the time being, for the next 45 minutes, that we're created this concept to make the antenna calculations easier, okay? So now I'm gonna just jump into the math, okay? So now remember from Maxwell's equations that, so from Maxwell's equations, whoops, put Maxwell into it. equations, whoops, um, del dot b is equal to zero. Okay, so that's the divergence of the field b is equal to zero. So this is from Maxwell's equations. And 
physically what this means is that magnetic flux lines flux lines always close on themselves meaning that there's no source or sink for a magnetic field line so for an electric field line you can have so for e fields field line you can have a charge positive or negative and oops so for an e field so this is as an aside and this would create you could have electric field lines starting at one and terminating at the other because there is such a thing as an isolated electric charge so you can have a beginning and end for an electric field lines okay but magnetic field lines there's no such thing that we've found so far as an isolated magnetic charge okay so as far as we know magnetic fields are created by the movement of charge and so long story short the way you get magnetic fields is for example you have a current through a wire and the, the magnetic field lines are go around that wire for example in this case and so so again this this my my pen being the wire the magnetic field lines go around this wire and there's no beginning and end to that magnetic field line so they always close on each other it's basically always a loop and this is what this divergence this mathematical meaning of this divergence always being zero for the magnetic field that's what that means okay now so okay so that was what maxwell's equations say and it makes sense because again we have no we haven't found any isolated magnetic um magnetic charges so th that's how we get magnetic field and then but this next thing i'm about to tell you is a mathematical concept is that oops is that vector this is what we're talking about math so vector identities they say that if you have a vector that's got this property whose divergence is zero if that's the case then that vector b should there should be another vector a the curl of which gives you b okay if so vector identity tells you if any vector has the property that del dot that vector, what do we call that vector? We'll just call it verb del dot, I wanna make it del dot x so that it's clear it's any vector. If that's the case, then there will be a vector y such that x is the curl of y. So, and so in the case of the magnetic field, again, now I'm, so now I'm talking about analytic methods. So we're, we're, we're introducing this intermediate value, this intermediate thing called, if this is called a vector potential. So A is called a, called vector field potential 
that has this property. Okay, so again, I'm an only we're only introducing this to. You'll have to believe me for the time being that it this makes the analysis of the antenna equations a little easier. Okay, and so this vector field potential is. Um, what should I say? Well, let me just leave it at this. So it's called the vector field potential. It has this property that the curl of it gives you the magnetic field. And we'll see that the relationship between the vector field potential and the magnetic field is a little bit like the relationship between the um, the voltage and electric field. So just as we created the concept of voltage to make it easier to deal with electric fields or the, the concept of electric potential, the same as voltage, to make it easier to deal with electric fields, we're introducing the concept of vector field potential for magnetic fields to make that to make it easier to deal with magnetic fields. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at why that's the case. Or first, like, let's derive, first thing I'm gonna do is draw derive this quantity A, this vector field A, and then we're gonna look at it in the case of a simple antenna. Okay, so first of all, assume Well, let me just first write the equation. Assume a conducting media, meaning a wire, in which case this d, d by dt is equal to zero. And so remember that this is another bit of magnetic, uh, sort of from Maxwell's equations. Del cross H was J plus D to DT, DT. So this guy goes to zero, okay, under this assumption. So I just think about the curl of H is some current density, okay? And this B is mu naught H. And so we're saying that B is curl of A. So that means that um, H is one over mu naught curl of, of A. <clears throat> Now, if I take the curl of both sides, or the curl of both sides of that, I end up with curl of H. So this is all sort of like vector, sorry, yeah, vector math, is one over mu naught curl of, curl of A. And this whole thing is equal to J is the current density. So J is current density enclosed by H. Okay, so this, this quantity here is, again, the math of this quantity ends up being the del of del dot A minus del squared A is equal to mu naught J. Okay, so we have this. Now, remember that this concept 
of del dot a, or sorry, the concept of a is something we are creating to make the analysis easier. So we actually have some leeway about some different, like how we define a. So for example, if we take this del dot a, okay, we actually have a choice of how to define it. So to define like a vector field fully, so let me just write this down, sorry, to define a fully, so, or, or any vector field, we need to define del cross a and del dot a. Del cross A, we started this whole thing by saying that we've defined as B. So we don't have any leeway in defining del cross A. But we can kind of pick, so no options for del cross A. So it's just B just a magnetic vector, but can pick del dot A, assuming it makes sense for the particular problem. So it fortunately turns out that for some types of problems, I can pick, so for some types of problems, we can pick del dot A to be equal to zero just some types of problems. And just incidentally, this is called Coulomb gauge. Don't ask me why. I don't know yet. I'll have to look this up. But this is just a verbiage. Coulomb gauge. Don't know why. Okay. So this is not a good assumption for every type of situation. So del dot A equal to zero is not a good assumption for every problem. For example, If E and M fields are time varying, it's not a great thing. So you have to use some other assumption. So you have to pick something called the Lorentz gauge, which gives you some other Thing for del dot a, but it's a little bit more complicated for now. I'm trying to keep our mathematical um, work a little simpler. So we're just going to go with this Coulomb gauge so that that way I can just make some, make an assumption that I can sort of get rid of this for this type of boundary problem is one way to look at it. Okay, so in this case, so for, so for, let me actually go to the next page. So, so 
So for Coulomb <clears throat> gauge assumption del dot A is equal to zero. And basically we're left with del squared A is equal to mu naught J, or we can move the minus to the other side. Okay, so now <clears throat> we've got this problem of figuring out this del squared A. Remember, we we're doing this whole thing to calculate A. So in, so in Cartesian coordinates, Um, a is x hat ax plus <clears throat> y hat ay plus z hat az. And the current density j is x hat jx plus y hat jy plus z hat jz okay so that means we can decompose fortunately del squared a so from this means we can decompose this problem problem into three kind of scalar values. That means, meaning that we can match the del squared A, basically we can match that, the X component of del squared A with the X component of J, Y component of del squared A with the Y component of J, Y, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so that makes life easier. So. Let me do that with x. So if we just look at the x component, so if we just look at x component with the definition of del squared a, <clears throat> we end up with a sub x as a function of r. So R being the observation point. <clears throat> is sort of the triple integral of mu naught J sub X R prime DV prime over four pi r hat minus r hat prime. <clears throat> Are you guys still with me, by the way? I get I got this thing that my internet connection is unstable. No, it's good. Okay, great. So, okay, what does this kind of mean? Okay, so this is what it means, is that I have, let's say I have a weird structure where there's current flow. So I have some funky wire. It has some current J, some, some current going through it with a current density of Jx. So two of these integrals, two of the three integrals, let's see, sorry, yeah. Two of the three integrals are just saying, give me the total current that's going through a section that I'm looking at. It's trying to figure out what this cross section is. So this is this figuring out this dv prime, okay? And by the way, r is 
the observation point. So if I was this was in Cartesian coordinates, <clears throat> R is a point here where I'm looking at the electric field and say R prime is where, where the current is. So it's basically this vector and whoops, that wasn't a very good drawing. Let me move R down. So this is the vector R, this is the observation point. The vector R prime is, is the place where the current is. And R minus R prime is this vector. So this is R minus R prime, okay? So when I say the this absolute value of r minus r prime. So this is distance from the current flow to where we are trying to calculate a. And we can just call that r for shorthand, the absolute value of that. So um, is equal to r minus r prime. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm trying to figure out an easy way to define this, but it's basically like you have, you're trying to calculate your current density at any point r prime so this is the two of these three integrals okay that's giving you the area where the current's flowing and then this third area is all the different you know currents along those all the different areas and then it's looking at the effect of that current on this parameter a a sub x or, or vector field in that's like sitting a distance apart. Okay, so this is the equation for that. So for like arbitrary shape of where the current's flowing. Okay, so now the nice thing is if my current was just flowing, so if current is flowing through a thin wire, then I can just replace the current density. So imagine as instead of it's instead of this shape, I had uh, whoops, this is Z. Instead of this shape, I had just a wire that's like a thin wire with the current flowing through it. Okay, that would that would kind of help me because let me just call it I sub x. That would help because that way I can get rid of I can basically this current value. I'm gonna put both of these in the same. There we go. And it's hard to. Okay, so that um, what I'm trying to do is this current density is this sort of arbitrary shape. Again, it makes up for two of these volume integrals so the surface integral is trying to figure out the current flowing but if i have the current flowing through a really thin wire then i can kind of replace those two not kind of i can replace those two integrals with the cross section with just the value of i sub x because the value of that those two integrals the surface integral the value of that will give me I sub X, okay? 
because you know I'm integrating over an infinitesimally narrow volume. So I have to like shrunk this guy into something really thin. So when I integrate the current density, I just end up with I sub X. And additionally to that is that all that currents, it's bunched up into one point here, whereas the current was bunched up into the other places. So anyway, I can replace this whole thing, assuming I have a thin wire with A sub X of R equal to the integral of mu naught I sub X R prime D L prime over four pi R. Okay, and this DL is, so this will be whatever, sort of a small chunk of this. And I'm, so basically what this says is if I integrate the current, so if I'm, I'm looking for what's happening at a point R, a, a sub X at a point R, so let's say this is A sub X at this point R, if I'm trying to calculate that, I would basically integrate the effects of all the current going through all these sections of DL sections of line. Okay, so I'm integrating over the whole line, and for each one, I'm gonna have a different capital R value, which is the diff distance from my observation point to where the current is, okay? But it makes life a lot easier because um, I just have like a sing sing single integral and I'm integrating over the length of this wire. Okay. So, okay, so this ends up being, so the, the simplified version of this equation of this vector potential. Okay, so now back to why we introduced this concept. So notice that the vector potential is pointing in the same direction as the current. Okay, so if this current is going in the in the I sub X direction, the 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 X component of the vector potential is pointing in the same direction as the current. So this concept we introduced as a vector potential is a, if the current's pointing in a certain direction, so the vector potential is pointing in the same direction. Why is that useful? Well, remember as long as we were staying with just magnetic fields, life was a lot harder because if you if I had the same current and I wanted to figure out the direction of the magnetic field, the magnetic field would be this cylinder, cylinder around this current. So I had a curl operation, the magnetic field was sort of perpendicular to the direction of this current flow. So if I had a funky shaped wire or some other sort of conductive type of situation, the magnetic field would be related to the current density or, or current with this you know, curl operation. And it was just a lot harder to keep track of than this vector field. So the, the nice thing about the vector field is you know if I have a current going in a certain direction the vector field is just pointing in the same direction so it doesn't have these weird curls and these kind of things so and then once I find the vector potential then either analytically or numerically from the vector potential so once I have this quantity a sub x from there I can get the value of basically B, B 
because then I all I have to do is to calculate the curl of A with respect to B. But again, if I have this complicated wave, if I have this complicated structure for my antenna or really anything where there's current flowing through it, the really important thing to remember is this vector field is always pointing in the same direction as the current. And once we find that, then we can go and separately, again, numerically or, or, or through sort of um, other, basically like non-numerically calculate the value of, of the B field. So it's basically an, a way of getting around the, the sort of like these complex relationship with, between the direction of the B field and the current. Okay. All right, so let's, let's look at the, by the way, the antennas are, um, so let's do it, sorry, example. Is a short current element. So we're gonna end, you know, we're we're gonna have like another lecture on antennas. So I'm just gonna introduce sort of the, the we just introduced this concept to help us figure that out. But I wanted to make sure you guys understood that we're really scratching the surface of antennas in this class with these like super basic um, concepts about antennas. So antennas get really, really, you have so many different types of antennas and, but the analysis methodology is what we're sort of using. So the example we'll probably use, we'll do dipole antennas which is like the simplest type of antenna. And then um, I don't know how far we'll get, but again, I just wanted you guys to understand that antennas are, are like, it's a very, very complicated field of designing antennas properly, as I'm sure you guys, I don't know if you, I, I've always messed with antennas and just, just at home and trying to get stuff to work. And so, sort of a complex topic. But let's take a look at this short example of how you would calculate this vector field in a really simple case. So let's say we have a really simple case and somehow we have a really short current element somehow, okay? So it's sitting in Cartesian coordinates, sitting in space, and It's this really short thing sitting in the direction of Z. So it means current is flowing this way along this current element. The length of this current element is delta L and assume delta L is, oops. is very small. All right, and then our observation point is P, meaning that we are calculating A at point P. And so the location of that point B, P, drew it way too far away. Let's say that's point P. So from the origin, whoops, the vector from the origin going to that point P is R.
and the vector sort of show, saying where the current is at any point is, I'm gonna draw it here so it's hard to see. So that's R prime is the location of the current. And so the vector between this point of the current and this point P is R is R minus R prime. So now as we can say that as delta L, it's very small. So as this length of this wire gets very, very small, this value of R prime gets really, really small. That means that R, you can just say it's roughly R, the, the capital R vector, I should have put a vector here, so that R is, in that case, is approximately R, and the absolute value of R, the, the, the length of R is the length of R. So we're trying to figure out the vector field for this particular case. So let's see what we end up with. So A is A sub Z. So again, remember that this is really, really important for making your life a lot easier for vector fields is the vector field is always in the direction of the current. So if I tell you the current is on the z-axis flowing in the z-direction, then the only component, then you know that the only component for the vector field is also lying on the z-direction. So I don't have to go looking for a sub x, a sub y, if as part of the problem, Either I've set up the problem or you know I've been told during the problem that the current's moving in a certain direction. I know that the vector field is moving in the same direction. Okay, so that is equal to mu naught I delta L over four pi R Z hat. So this is I'm um, basically looking at this equation. So now I don't I don't even have to do the integral because the length of the wire, so this integral of I sub x dl prime is just I sub x is just I this is I sub x is I. The full integral because the length of the wire was only delta L was delta L. So I end up that integral gives me mu naught I delta L four pi R because we said the wire is really short and we made this R the same as basically the point basically the vector from the origin to that point of start to that point by using this approximation. So it just ends up being four pi r. So this r is basically the distance from the observation point. This r ends up being the distance from the observation point to this filament. Okay? And it's pointing in the direction of z. So in this case, at this point, I would have a vector that's pointing in the z direction. So it's, the vector would be pointing up only and it would have this value. So it's dropping in value inversely proportional to the distance away from my current element. And it's always pointing in the z direction. So this kind of shows you that sort of the fact that we got rid of, and then what I would do to get the B field, so the B field to get B field, I'm not gonna do it, but to get B field, you'd say, okay, this is equal to curl of A 
or curl of a sub z. So whatever this is. So curl of mu naught i delta l over 4 pi r z. So that's what I would get the magnetic field. But you can kind of see how it makes it almost, in, in this particular case, where I have a really thin wire, it makes it really easy to calculate this uh, vector field. And then once I, once I have the vector field, I can get the B field by taking the curl of that vector field. Okay, so this is a concept <clears throat> we needed for looking at antennas. So I'm gonna <clears throat> stop here because although we have 30 minutes, the like the antenna thing is gonna be, we're just gonna go do a dipole antenna, but I think we should do it in one shot. So this is a concept we needed to get for the antenna. So next basically next lecture which will be our last lecture we're going to go through dipole antennas and figure out look at how we can use these vector fields to sort of figure out the dipole antenna okay and in the meanwhile like we talked i'll be putting up um, a video for the last assignment this weekend showing you how I go through, how it goes through solving it, and then I'll also add the other assignments during the week. Um, any questions? Yeah, somebody said sounds like antenna designers are modern day wizards. Yep, they are. I mean, I think it's a very specialized field, but um, so the you know the other thing then to worry about. Well, that that is certainly the case like the antenna design itself is really important but the opposite of antenna design is also very important what do i mean by the opposite of antenna design so i guess you know we haven't actually talked about antennas but let's think about these currents um so we're saying there's a I mean, I, I think we've been saying this all along, but you have a current, you've, you've got a magnetic field around that current, okay? So, and when, you, when you're trying to launch an electromagnetic field, you design an antenna to make it, as you'll see, what you wanna do is to make that current turn that current efficiently into an electromagnetic wave. Okay, so great. That's what you're trying to do. You're actually trying to create an electromagnetic wave. Great. Now think about the, all the rest of the stuff on your printed circuit board. Let's say you're designing a printed circuit board or a piece of electronics. You have all sorts of currents in, I have all sorts of currents Okay, going around in different directions, right? If printed circuit board, you, you don't even really think about where the, which direction the currents are flowing in your printed circuit boards. You have like hundreds and thousands of wires with currents going up and down, etc. So what, what happens there? So you have all these conductors different bits and pieces pointing in different directions with currents flowing in different directions. What are they doing? Well, unfortunately, they're all acting, unless you're really careful, they're acting like little antennas. So each one of them is acting like an antenna and your board is basically emitting electromagnetic waves, unintended electromagnetic waves, into space. And that's called electromagnetic interference. So this is another place that I feel like these concept of understanding antenna is really important, is when you're designing something that's not meant to be an antenna, but you have to control the 
electromagnetic waves coming from all these unintended antennas that are constantly emanating, okay? So now how do you control that? Well, fortunately, a bunch of these e &M waves, the, a lot of the currents in your board aren't shifting that fast. The fact that they're pointed in random directions and happening at kind of random times means that they're not all adding to each other in an efficient way, okay? So they're not, if they were all pointing in the same direction, if they were all changing quickly and at the same frequency, then you'd have a serious problem, okay? So fortunately, that sort of helps your situation as, as long as you can as long as you can manage that case. Now let's think of where are the exceptions to that. The exceptions to that are when you have, again, in your printed circuit board in a microelectronic case, the exception to that is when you have long lines, okay, that are running relatively fast, okay? Those are what we called transmission lines Okay, in the first half of the class, long lines, relatively long lines that are operating really fast. If, and that was, that's another reason we want to des carefully design a transmission line is because if you guys watch the video for the inductance calculations and the magnetic field calculations for a coax, okay, so I'm just going to another transmission line coax, which is kind of easier to understand is that the coax structure, the transmission line structure itself, contained the magnetic field and sort of was it like an anti-antenna. It's keeping all the energy of the magnetic field caused by the currents and whatnot in your transmission line structure and it's preventing it from spilling out into space. So that's like another reason for transmission lines, not just to get the data, it's, it's getting the data efficiently from one place to another, but it's also preventing the energy of that data from spilling out into the world in the form of electromagnetic interference. And by the way, I like this electromagnetic interference is something that all basically all electronics products you have to pass this electromagnetic interference test and so if you're spilling too much electromagnetic waves into space then they won't basically your product won't get approved for sale in the u.s or wherever has got the rules for this kind of thing and um so it's a very, very difficult part of engineering your printed circuit board and something that people don't think about. Anyway, so that's sort of the antenna and the anti-antenna in my mind is the transmission line preventing this noise. All right, guys, so that's it for today's lecture. Um, Fo, Fu asked if I would put up the PDFs, be happy to do that. Alexandria says receiver you're asking what how the receiver equation would work or maybe okay I said never mind okay sounds good guys so um, have a good weekend and uh, I'll talk to you guys next Friday um, can I ask you a quick question about the second sure what's that that's what I thought sorry oops wait sorry my computer is talking to me are you still there Oh, still there. Yeah, sorry. That was my Siri. I hit the wrong button. It's all right. Go ahead. No. Okay. Um, for the presentation that we're going to present, uh, for the papers you gave, we only take one paper. Right, right. So so you're asking about, so just so that we, uh, Amina, just to not to confuse the rest of the class, you're asking about the other class you're taking from me. Yeah. So whoever's not taking yeah. the VLSI class, never mind this question. So I mean, are you, you're, can yeah. you ask the question again? Okay, uh, the papers you gave, uh, yeah. we pick one topic. Right, just pick one paper. 
one paper and the way the uh, PowerPoint, the presentation, you would like us to just um, like analyze it, uh, like uh, add more information, some schematics. Yeah. So the way to basically the, um, the idea behind it is this mm -hmm. happens a lot at work, like right? you basically get assigned to go study a topic and then sort of present the summary of it to other people in your mm -hmm. group or whatever. So the idea would be to take a paper and either focus, uh, my suggestion, Amina, is to focus on just two or three topics in the paper, not the whole paper, because the papers are pretty complex. So I think it's kind of over, like you'd, you'd have a lot, need to have a lot more experience before you can condense the whole paper into a 10 minute presentation. So I would pick two or three like topics from the paper and present those in a set of slides over, you know, a 10 minute presentation. Okay, got it. And is okay, uh, like from the topics we pick, we use the same schematics or you would like us to research, get something else and explain it related to it? No, no, no. The same schematics. You're basically explaining oh. that paper. Got it. Got yeah. It so sense. just, just cut and paste. Okay. Makes sense. And uh, one more question for uh -huh. 3250 plus. Uh -huh. Uh, for the, uh, which textbook do you uh, use or you recommend other than the one on the syllabus? Um, you know, the one I, I think I'm, did I put this thing up? There's one that's, they're all, you know, I like all mm -hmm. electromagnetic. I don't think that like the, a lot of them are good. There's one that's like free. Mm -hmm. That's by Stalin, S-T-A-E-L-I-N. Okay. Um, I will put the link on the announcement so you can just, um, it's, it's free from, it's like a, professor from MIT wrote it okay, I think nice. it's a yeah but I think they're all pretty good because the topic has been around for a long time so I think any of them would work okay nice and yeah. uh, one more question mm -hmm. um, the, one of the assignment six uh, it does not have the uh, solution for it okay wait okay yeah. I'll go I'll go look for it and put it up I mean, if it's including for the coming quiz, then yeah, if not, then later. Okay, sounds good. By the way, Amina, uh, going back to the text. Yes. I personally find like Wikipedia and like YouTube. Uh, okay. But be, be careful, of course, you have to be careful. Like YouTube is like very dangerous, especially because you yeah. watch somebody's explanation um, there's no control of it, but for sure, like, I feel like the Wikipedia pages mm. on, let's say if you looked at, if you're, if you're thinking about the concept of like an antenna or Maxwell's equations or whatever, the Wikipedia pages are really, really good and really, okay. really focused. So I would really suggest you start in Wikipedia. Um, if you're Closer if you're going looking for something, yeah. But I'll put that I'll put that that other um, text. On, okay. No uh, worries. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, guys. Take I care. Bye. Bye. Bye.